Hi, I'm Vince Molinero, and welcome to the Lead the Future podcast. I'm really excited to have my guest, Wayne Monteith, uh, for this episode. He is the Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation for the FAA, which is the Federal Aviation Administration. And he has an illustrious career, spent 29 years in the U.S. Air Force. And uh, before he moved into civilian life, he was the Brigadier General and Commander of the 45th Space Wing in Florida. So welcome, Wayne. I'm so excited to um, have this opportunity to chat with you about all things leadership. Let's dive in. Given your, your vast experience, it would be, be helpful to kind of understand a little bit about your career and what for you were one or two critical leadership experiences you've had. Well, first off, Vince, thanks so much for, for inviting me on. Uh, I've really been looking forward to this and, and I really looked or I've really enjoyed our discussions on leadership. And maybe most importantly, this is an opportunity for, for me to actually talk about a subject other than regulations. Uh, and as exciting as regulations can be, you can imagine that after a while, it, it does, uh, does tend to tarnish a little bit. I would say, you know, right up front that I spent probably the first 15 years of my career sort of honing my skills. Started out as a missile weapons officer uh, in the United States Air Force. Uh, did that, did test and evaluation, had some tremendous opportunities, but really never led big teams. And so what I relied upon was some of the experiences I had before I came into the Air Force. I was a retail manager, so responsible for uh, success of a small business. All the way back in high school, I was a team captain uh, for uh, running teams. And so I tried to build on that. Probably the most important uh, uh, aspect of that first 15 years was the tremendous mentors I had who helped me become the leader that I am today. It's critical uh, that that folks, particularly in leadership positions, take the time to mentor, motivate, inspire the next generation. And, and I had bosses that, that did that for me. But probably the, the first real big leadership challenge I ever had was uh, about the 14 year part or point in my career I was selected to run a, a training squadron out in California. And, and the squadron trained all missileers, uh, missile launch officers, and all future space officers for the Air Force. And so a cadre of about 100 people uh, and about 200 lieutenants, brand new officers. Think of it as college kids with money uh, all of a sudden. And so you've got 200 people every single day uh, thinking of new and creative ways to get you fired. And so you've got to try to stay ahead of that. Now, considering the number of people I was responsible for was greater than the sum total of everybody I'd been responsible for leading up until that point. Three days into uh, my command tour as a training squadron commander, I had a young officer, lieutenant, uh, get uh, stopped and arrested for DUI. And so my experience was uh, three days into this, and I'm like, okay, it's 200 lieutenants. These things happen. It's unfortunate, but they happen. This was on a Saturday afternoon. When this happened, uh, Sunday morning, my boss, uh, who I really didn't know, uh, calls me into his office and and says, you have a problem, Wayne. And I'm like, oh, OK, he doesn't understand. It's just lieutenants. And he said, no, you have a you have an alcohol problem in your squadron. And I'm like, well, you know, it's yes, it's a DUI and it's bad. And he says, no, you have an officer DUI on average uh, every six weeks, which oh, was wow. incredible. I'd never heard about this or seen anything like this in my entire career. He said, yes, that is absolutely bad. I started digging into it and this squadron had done great on inspections and all of those types of things, but there was really some systemic issues. But at the heart of it, it was how we looked at those lieutenants. And the way we, we looked at them were they were students who happened to be lieutenants, as opposed to lieutenants who happened to be students. So we treated them as students and we didn't mentor them. We didn't spend time with them. And and once we made that shift and we started doing some other things, we actually went 18 months without a DUI. Wow. And so if you look at that, we probably saved about 18 careers just by stopping that. But you had to look below the surface to figure out what was really going on. And we turned a, a squadron that was number four of four into number one of 96. Uh, in one year. Wow. 
but it took a lot of personal hands-on leadership and it took buy-in from all of those subordinate leaders. And we completely changed the organization. And so that was kind of my first exposure. My next big exposure was at, in Colorado Springs, uh, where I uh, ran the space unit that was responsible for giving or providing GPS to the world. And you think about it, it's like, well, what could possibly go wrong? We, we had some of the same issues there. But the thing that stands out most to me about that leadership opportunity is that you have to leave or lead by example. And a couple of days into to that new assignment, my four-star general comes on base, who I've known for you know, 15, 18 years, and, he's, and, and we were building new houses. For the first time, this base was gonna get houses, 242 homes. He said, Wayne, I don't think there should be houses out here. I never agreed there should be houses out here. If I could tear them all down today, I would tear them all down today and you'll never fill them. So I said, okay, uh, leadership challenge accepted. And so I sat down with the contractor and I said, okay, how can, you know, how can we entice people to get out here? Well, the first thing that struck me is that the home that I was supposed to live in was the last of the 242 homes to be built. And so the expectation was I would be living in Colorado Springs and the base was 10 miles outside of town telling people you go live there, not me. And so we sat down and we worked with this team and we moved my home to the front of the list and I moved out there and said, come live out here. Just looking at it differently and leading by example, and we ended up with a waiting list by the time I left. Wow. And I let that four star know. Yeah. And then finally, you know, at the 45th Space Wing, reorganizing. And so organizing for success and, and streamlining so that we could take an organization that was used to launching one rocket about every five to six weeks to being able to launch uh, multiple times in a single week with no additional people. So each one had a different uh, kind of uh, framework of which to exercise leadership. As I'm hearing those stories, a couple of themes there, kind of digging deeper to understand what's the systemic issue going on and, and, and really addressing that as opposed to addressing you know, something superficial, number one. Number two is the sense of setting standard, either personally, you know, through the example you set, but also setting the standards of, of how you, you know, treated those lieutenants initially as, as uh, lieutenants first and the mm -hmm. expectation that that carried with them so people knew how they needed to behave and what the expectation was. Those are great, great examples, uh, you know, for all of us. And what so far in this year uh, have been the leadership lessons you've been getting out of that as you've been continuing to lead in the role you have now? Probably the most important thing is, is flexibility. You know, nobody expected us to be in this. And, and uh, you know, from my perspective, leadership is a lot easier uh, when it's hands on. And so we used to call it uh, pressing the flesh, shaking hands, as opposed to pressing the enter key. And so it's a completely different mindset. And, and too yeah. often, I think leaders uh, get trapped into one style of leadership. And so what I used to refer to it as is a chameleon leadership, being able mm -hmm. to adapt to your audience, adapt to your situation. And that's what we've had to do. Now, while uh, we are uh, socially isolated and we're not in our building, the leadership responsibilities continue. And so what we've done is we've morphed, uh, not just you know, hitting the enter key and sending messages to people, but we do the Hollywood Squares or the Brady Bunch Zoom calls. Uh, I do those every right. single month with the entire team. And I can tell you, uh, I've met every single dog uh, that belongs to a member of our team, something I may not have ever done. And I know their right. names and a little bit about their personalities, but you have to shift because the work still goes on. And the work that we do, you know, protecting the public uh, during rocket launches and inherently dangerous business must continue. And one of the things that makes all that work is social capital. And, you know, as a leader, you have to build up that social capital. Your, your team has to trust you. And yeah. you as the leader have to figure out a way to connect. Yeah, and and that's so right. I mean, the social capital uh, you've got to earn it, right? And, and and that that becomes really critical. So you know, you, you talked about you know the primary focus of, of your work, and you are in a, an exciting uh, industry as you know space aviation is growing at, at uh, an unprecedented rate. Um, uh, certainly the need for data communications, the number of satellites going up. What's it like to be kind of at the forefront of what was always an amazing industry, 
as someone who grew up wanting to be an astronaut <laughs> at some point in time, uh, like most of us. Uh, and and w- what's that like? Well, I, I, can, I can tell you, I get up every morning with a smile on my face that I get to do what I do. Uh, and, and this is really an extension yeah, of, sure. of what I was doing at Cape Canaveral. I used to tell people if you know if you're you're not fortunate enough uh, to to be employed driving a truck, then launching rockets is about the next best thing. It's cool. It brings out the eight year old in in all of us uh, to see all of these miracles come together and a rocket actually successfully lift off and and make it into orbit. I refer to this time that we're in right now as the second renaissance of space. It's really like the heyday of the 60s. Uh, the 50s and the 60s is, is we were establishing ourselves in space. And we're seeing that same thing again. We're seeing the innovation, the ingenuity. We're seeing a common sense of purpose throughout the government all the way through to the American people. And it's just, it's fascinating to watch. And it is incredible to be a part of uh, I was I was uh, looking at you know my uh, my organization and how we respond to this and, and I like using numbers to demonstrate where we're going. In 2010, my office supported one commercial launch. It was a commercial launch they called Sea Launch, which was a consortium of U.S. and Russian Ukrainian companies, and it launched in the South Pacific. One launch, and it didn't even occur from the United States commercial launch. Three times this year, we've launched or supported two launches on a single day. So three times this year on a single day, we've doubled that. We launched more than we did in 2011 and 2012. And we see this coming. And so what we see on the manifest in December, I will probably see our third record setting month this year alone. And and so I see this geometric curve. And so whereas a decade ago, uh, you had one launch or, or three launch, four launches, but certainly for about a five year period, single launches, we will probably hit 40 this year. And that's just the launch side. Now we have landings, we have boosters coming back. Uh, we have for both uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin. We now have commercial human space flight, uh, wow. you know, the NASA mission. Uh, we've got uh, companies like Virgin Galactic should be flying space tourists next year. Oh my gosh, uh, could wow. you imagine that, you know, as a, as a kid wanting to be an astronaut that this was all gonna come? I just took the easy way out. Just got to get myself a ticket on one of those flights. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've talked to uh, Sir Richard Bransom and said, I am willing to, you know, to go up if you need a test subject. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. What's happening in that industry is 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 quite remarkable and dramatic. And, and it is a way like it's really bringing the future um, to us in a way that we may not even manage, like you say, you know, five, even 10 years ago. And while you're in the industry, I'm curious, what do other leaders in other industries, what do they need to understand about what's happening in the space industry and how it might impact other businesses that are even unrelated to that? What's your sense on that? What many people fail to understand is how important and how integral space is to our lives right now. There are very few things from a technology perspective we can do without space. Uh, we just can't, you know, it, it, it's the old adage, well, I don't need satellites. All I need is my Garmin uh, that can get me to grandmother's house. Well, that's interesting. Uh, but unless you've got a chip scale a- atomic clock in your Garmin, you can't do that. You have to have these right. satellites. We can't communicate uh, without the satellites. You know, watching television, it's all of that. And so it's this this huge economic driver, uh, and not just here, but as we push off world as well. And we have to understand that and understand that it's important for us to continue down that path. It's not just mm-hmm. about developing the next big pen uh, from from NASA, it truly is uh, pushing the human species further out into into the universe, uh, in embracing that because it also drives innovation, uh, it drives entrepreneurship, uh, it it helps uh, excite people about uh, STEM, you know, science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. Uh, which is which again is uh, all part of our future. So that all ties together. And, and as uh, leaders in other sectors, I think we, we really need to embrace where space is going and not look at it as a competitive, you know, something that my industry has to compete against, but this is something we can all do together. Somebody doesn't have to fail for space to succeed. The analogy, something I learned when I, when I toured, uh, I was at the 45th, uh, uh, you know, the space, space wing uh, with your team and got kind of a bit of a behind the scenes understanding of what was playing out in this industry. It was quite quite a, a, a highlight for me 
from a career standpoint to understand that. But what was really fascinating in talking to your team is so much of the effort that we think about is always in the liftoff, um, but that the reentry is is actually quite challenging. And 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 I was using that analogy as as I was working with my clients, you know, um, certainly over the summer as as we were in this period of wanting to go back to what it was the normal thinking about coming back to whatever the new normal was. And I was still always, that didn't rest well with me. I was thinking, no, I, I don't think that will happen. I think, I think what we have is something a little bit more like re-entry. It's going to be a different world. There's mm-hmm. different challenges. And, and you had a you know, really interesting perspective. And, and your sense was that that analogy worked, but you're more of <laughs> the expert on it. Uh, what's your sense of that analogy of what leaders are going to have to face over the next, say, six months or, or a year as you know, we're trying to figure out what does coming back uh, mm-hmm. going to look like if we come back into offices, if we come back to face-to-face uh, like it used to be? What's your sense of what we got to pay attention to using well, that analogy of re-entry? Well, well I think your, 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 your whole scenario was, was right to begin with. Lifting off from Earth, going to the space station, then, then re-entering back into society. And, you know, I, I would say for personally, uh, you know, at the beginning of, of this global health crisis, because we didn't really understand how bad it really was, we in the FAA uh, decided to do a single exercise day where we were going to test our, our uh, uh, technology, our IT systems, to see if it could handle everybody working remotely. And we didn't go back to the office. And for the first week, two weeks, three weeks, that was kind of fun. It was almost like a sleepover, slumber party. It was something different. But then it started to drag on. And, and we didn't go back. And the reason I think that's important is because it impacts the new normal. So okay. like coming back from the space station, not only is the world you come back to different, but you're different. Mm-hmm. I, I think we're going to be different as we reintegrate back into some type of a more traditional setting. And I think it's important for us to realize that that not only has the environment changed, you know, something as simple as having to wear masks uh, almost all the time, uh, to, to the perceptions of our people into ours. And, and one of the things that, that strikes me is even with all the data that's out there right now on how this health emergency has uh, has morphed and, and, and come about, we still have, I, th- I think the latest numbers I saw, about 40% of folks uh, will not take a vaccination. Right. And, and so, so as a leader, you're going to have to deal with that as well. Because those are real fears that people have, and you can't just, you know, it's like we talked earlier. If you look at the surface, say, well, yes, you should get a vaccine. Well, no, there's something deeper. There's something more underlying to that. I mean, you know, maybe there's a different experience, but as a leader, you're going to have to deal with that. And I think it's a a fallacy uh, to think that we can go to a either back to the original normal or what is a new normal? What is a normal anymore? Yeah, and, and you know, I think that complexity I think is going to be greater. And I love that line about I mean when you come back down, you know, from the space station, not only has, you know, the world changed, but you've changed. And I think just having uh, leaders think about how has this year changed you? How has it changed your team, your people? Because I I think for some, for, for a lot of employees who've now been able to work remotely and have a taste of what that's like, I think they're going to come back with a different set of expectations that will create a challenge for leaders. That's just one example. I think there's going to be many, many of them saying, I don't know if I want to do a 90 minute commute uh, every morning, uh, five days a week. Um, You know, so I think there will be some really interesting issues that we'll need to really navigate ourselves through as, as leaders. And, And that I just, that, that idea is so powerful about how have you changed and how has your team changed? Particularly, you know, talking to my peers in, in the FAA, uh, we have a new appreciation for the power of remote work uh, because there are circumstances where it works. I was never a fan of it before now. And while I, I wouldn't want to continue in this, I believe a hybrid of sorts, we can actually find those efficiencies, we can maximize our effectiveness and still build our teams up. And we just have to look at this problem set differently. And, and again, it comes back to you know, don't discount things because you see something on the surface. So you see one individual takes advantage of teleworking. So therefore, you don't think teleworking has any value. You have to dig a little bit deeper. And, and as I believe we've talked about before, you know, leadership is a journey. It's not a destination. And so we yeah. continue to learn these things, uh, the old dog and new tricks. 
you know, we add these types of things to our toolbox uh, as we go forward to help us become even more effective. You know, really knowing what's what's important becomes critical. I mean, uh, you know, when we last spoke, you, you talked about, you know, that experience you had, I guess, I think it was around 2016 when uh, Hurricane Matthew hit. Yeah. Um, and and you, I think you got to tell that story because it's it's so priceless because I think it helps us understand what's really important when something matters. So well, why don't you share that? Because uh, that's one of my favorite stories of 2020. What was interesting is as Matthew was was bearing down onto the the uh, space coast, even as as early as four or five days before it actually hit, you know we were talking about having a hurricane party because it was just another one that was going to be a near miss. Fate uh, directed it towards us. And for the first time in the uh, the 45th Space Wings history, we did a 100% evacuation. Wow. Uh, never been done before. Uh, we hadn't practiced it before, but we did it. And I still have the key that I used to lock the gates uh, as I was the last person off the gate. We had shut down our power grids, our water grids, everything as we prepared. And then we hunkered down at Cape Canaveral in a facility that would withstand a Category 5 hurricane, which we thought Matthew was going to be when it hit. Long and the short of it is, Matthew... Uh, jogged about uh, 15 miles to the east, uh, went through an eye wall replacement when it came by us. So it was really a weak category four that caused about $80 million in damage. Uh, and remember, we had evacuated everybody and and, and sent them to, to safety, and the base had significant damage. My golf course alone, uh, 86 trees were down. And so there was damage all across the installation. I went around the base and filmed. I filmed neighborhoods, I filmed the marina, and let people know that, hey, we're, we've got damage here. Your homes are safe. However, it's going to be a little while before we get back. Well, when we made the decision to come back uh, to reopen the base to our residents, I had a choice that day of taking a, a helicopter uh, tour uh, with my, my good friend, uh, Bob Cabana, the director of Kennedy Space Center, uh, to survey the damage and so that I could get a better understanding of how much damage we had at Cape Canaveral as well, which suffered significant damage. But instead, what I did was, again, that leadership by example, I chose to work the gate, uh, so our security mm -hmm. gate that day, and I personally welcomed every single resident back, uh, thanked them uh, for their patience with us, let them know that if they needed anything, they could call me, they could call the leadership team, but really just put their minds at ease that we were working for them to keep them safe and do everything that we could to get them back to their life the way it was before. Uh, and it was probably the uh, the single most important thing I did during that, uh, that entire three-year uh, experience because a year later we had to do the same thing for Irma. Uh, and the residents were far better prepared and they knew – uh, that we would do everything in our power to to keep them safe uh, and keep their property safe. And during those two evacuations, we did not suffer a single injury uh, or casualty to any of our folks. That's remarkable. The story kind of loops back around to your earlier point around social capital, right? Because in your role, you probably could have convinced yourself, I need to be on that chopper surveying. Everyone would understand that. Uh, they would not expect you being at the gate. And, and that's yeah. such a powerful decision. And I think if we connect the dots back to even reentry, I think for all of us as leaders to really think about what are the things you think are important that in fact you can <laughs> delegate so you can actually focus on the social capital, focus on being there uh, and setting the tone that you did with your people. It was something I'd learned, you know, from from one of my mentors on on taking the time to to thank people uh, and, and people who are not at your level. And I used to tell the, you know, kind of jokingly that I thought my four-star boss spent more time thanking the custodial staff than he did his generals. And I probably wasn't too far off because he knew in the way he told the story, he knew that, you know, if one of the generals didn't show up to work, the machine would go on. If a custodian didn't show up for a month, guess what? Everything came to a screeching halt. So really who right. was the more important person? Right. And so when I was at, uh, uh, Colorado Springs, out there we have terrible weather. Well, not terrible weather. We have, you know, rain and snow and ice storms. And so on the worst days, I would do the same thing. I would work the gate uh, and make sure people made it in safely. Uh, one individual coming in and she pulled up and her her uh, uh, windshield wiper was frozen to her windshield. Uh, so I pulled out a credit card and I scraped it off, scraped it so wow. she could see it. She was safe. And she didn't realize who I was until I was about two minutes into this. And she was like, oh, my gosh. 
you're the commander. And I said, yes, ma'am, and please be safe. And so, but it's those little opportunities. And, and I say that because I think it's important for leaders to be seen and, mm-hmm. and be out in front of your organization and showing people that you care about them. So one of the one of the things as we think about you know leading the future is you know there's a lot of young people now who this year is uh, I'm sure one that creates anxiety probably a little concern about about their personal future as they're starting out and what would be your uh, words of wisdom uh, to kind of this you know young generation of of leaders that are at this moment in time in our history uh, all starting their careers at a really tough moment. I would say a a couple of things. Number one, be flexible. Number two, be patient. Opportunity presents itself in in a myriad of ways. And you may have in your mind what the next 20 to 25 years looks like before you become the CEO. Things are going to change in that period. I, I can tell you personally, I had probably three jobs during my Air Force career that folks would have said were were most likely, uh, if not career enders, career detours. But I made the best of them. It was the job I had at the time, and it was the most important job I was going to have during my career, in my mind. And that's the way I approached it. And they all turned out to be building blocks to where I eventually ended up. So I, I didn't get discouraged. And so the other thing is to be patient. One of the things that I see... Uh, future leaders getting wrapped around in is I need that duty title now. I need that important sounding duty title. And the way I look at it during my military career was I believed, and I I was proof of this, that the length of your duty title is inversely proportional to your importance. And so I actually had a duty title when I was in the the Pentagon as a colonel that was, because it was, it was actually two jobs in one, was 17 words long. 17 wow. words long, and I had almost no power, no responsibility, any of that. Uh, whereas the single most uh, rewarding uh, title, duty title I ever had was commander, one word. And so be, be careful on what you really are chasing. Are you chasing experience? Are you chasing uh, building blocks? Or are you chasing a duty title? This uh, uh, global health emergency is going to set us back a little bit. Yeah. But it just sets us back, and it may set us on a different path. And so, you know, you never know what's going to open next month or the month after, yeah. but you have to yeah. have an open mind. Those are great words to end by. Uh, thank you so much, Wayne, for the generosity of your time uh, to share your insights with uh, everyone who listens or watches this podcast. Uh, always great to uh, spend time talking to you. I, I learned so much uh, from you. and. Uh, I wish you continued success in your in your great work, and uh, uh, maybe at one point I'll be on one of those uh, Virgin flights up uh, <laughs> uh, into orbit. We'll see. Hopefully, we'll be on one together. That'd be awesome. Thanks so much for your time. And thanks, Vince. Really appreciate the time today.